Phenom advertised itself as an ultra-secure mobile cell phone messaging app with confidentiality assured to avoid surveillance. Only problem was that it was run by the government as part of a massive operation to catch criminals. Mmm, Smithers, I can still sell him snake oil. <laughs> Many consider this a honeypot, which is now a buzzword to describe really anything, actually. So let's talk about what honeypots are, how to spot one, and why they're important even outside of this little digital rights privacy space, and how we critically think about the world. Now, for the record, there is no completely agreed upon definition for a honeypot. In more formal computing, it's just an environment for showing how attackers work, whatever that means. In cybersecurity, people can set up honeypots as a way to lure cyber criminals away from legitimate targets. Maybe you're a company and you want to make people think that something is your server when it's not, so they attack totally wrong place. And in the digital rights space, it seems to just be something that's compromised by somebody. Seems to be associated with governments, but the theories I've seen just are insane. I've seen pretty much every service, even the most reputable in our resources, be called a honeypot at one point or another. Why does this even matter, Henry? What's the issue if a service of mine is a honeypot? I'm not a criminal. Well, I'm sure many people would make this argument that there's actually no real risk of being caught in a honeypot if you're not doing anything wrong, it is a fundamentally very short-sighted approach. The method in which honeypots would function would have to rely on the ability to collect enough data about each person to be able to judge if they are, in fact, a criminal. In the example of tools focused on digital rights, the goal is usually the opposite, to know as less as possible about each user. So for something to be a real honeypot, it would need to fight the ethos of privacy and individual control and autonomy. Now theories and hypotheticals aside, you can always just pose the question of who's actually deciding what's a criminal. I am a criminal. In some countries, being homosexual will get you killed, and that's something that would need to be properly protected. And in other countries, that's less of a risk. It's also worth asking if you wanna be grouped up in a service with a majority of criminals. Why, why would you put yourself in that situation and even try to be caught up in that? Makes you look like you got something to hide. And most importantly, it's about ethics. If something advertises itself as not collecting invasive data about you, we want to make sure that's actually what's going on because you deserve that because you, you love yourself and you want better for yourself. So I want to share with you my five and a half steps to help gauge if something is a honeypot. First, Target audience. Most actual honeypots are branded towards illegal activities because that's the core target. They don't want a normie user base of millions of people to have to actually maintain. They just want the criminals. Second, branding. Services that value their users will very forwardly tell them where they can and can't protect them. This is why services like ProtonMail said way back in 2014 in a blog post that they can be legally obligated to hand over an IP address, which did end up happening, but the heads up was always there. This is also why projects like Tor have detailed documentation referring to threat modeling and what exactly Tor is designed to protect against. Ultimately, there is no perfect tool for privacy and security, and the people who acknowledge that and tell you how they're not perfect are the ones less likely to be honeypots. Some quick red flags to throw your way are buzzwords like instant anonymous, instant anonymity, 100% anonymous, completely private or completely secure, or any other really wild promises that simply cannot be made or guaranteed. Third, proprietary technologies. This commonly shows up in two different places that I see. The first is from organizations who brag about some weird proprietary technology that's their own thing that no one else in the world has that and they can't even describe how or why it works the way it does. It's just awesome and perfect and no one's figured it out except them. Red flags, people, immediately run away. You want people to share exactly how technologies work that you'll be relying on. If you're someone who invented a new revolutionary technology and you don't think people would believe you, you'd probably want to prove to them how it works to actually demonstrate what you did. You wouldn't try to hide behind a... You wouldn't try to be missing. You would I'm, I'm just saying, maybe you all should watch Wizard of Oz. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz, you ungrateful creatures? The second time proprietary comes up is in the context of open source software. Now, yes, open source software is much more transparent and enables us as a community to better audit the software and services we use. However, there is also an objectively false form of reasoning that exists, which quite literally is all proprietary software is a honeypot. 
which is objectively just not true. While open source is almost always the king of transparency and something we should seek, we cannot just immediately classify non-open source software as a honeypot. That's silly. With that said, if something is open source, it is much less likely to be something of concern, so it's still ultimately something to look for when choosing your software. Fourth, public teams. Uh, I know it's ironic, but having a public team for a privacy service is immensely important. It means that someone or a team of people believe enough in their service to attach their identities to it. This is why I'm here as Henry on this channel, as well as many of the wonderful team members who develop the services that you use. It's also worth mentioning that the absence of a public team isn't always an immediate red flag. It's worth prime to see why they're not public and see what their reasoning is. Fifth, too good to be true. This is the most vague rule, but it's simply that if something seems too good to be true, it normally is. Technology is exciting, and this one is hard because sometimes we do see groundbreaking new developments that blow everyone away that are entirely 100% legit. A technique I've picked up to make it better decisions in these kind of situations is to wait several days, if not like a week, for the hype to die down and to see if it's something actually legit. And a lot of times after the first day or two, it actually comes out that some new service isn't that good, or it's missing key features, or people found it to be a privacy nightmare, or something like that. And the next step is actually do your research. Uh, a lot of people will just sign up for services and not even read the privacy policies and then accuse them of doing insane things that are actually properly already acknowledged either by the service itself, its privacy policy, its terms and conditions, or the community at large. So before you hop on a, this must be a honeypot because it uses a single tracker on its website, look into why they use a tracker. They might have a valid reason for doing so. So again, everyone, one, check the target audience, make sure services are geared towards users and not criminals. Two, look for honest branding that tells you what a service can and can't do. Three, avoid proprietary technologies. Four, look for public teams. Five, ask if it's too good to be true. And five and a half, dig a little bit deeper and actually look at services to see what they can and can't provide. And of course, I'm gonna leave the natural disclaimer of this is not foolproof and there could be some of the most sophisticated honeypots that actually pass all these requirements, but it's highly unlikely and it would be incredibly tough to pull off and it would make massive news and people would probably discover it pretty quickly. Now let's get to the most important part of this video and it's why this matters. I already touched on this a little bit earlier through the lens of digital rights, but these steps and guidelines are kind of actually just critical thinking skills. And it's a critical thinking toolbox for most things in the world. If you're trying to avoid BS supplements that don't do anything, check the target audience. Look for honest marketing. Avoid weird proprietary formulas. Make sure there are real people behind it and ask if it's too good to be true and actually do due diligence research and if it aligns with reality. You can apply this to so many issues in the world and ultimately it's good for all of us to critically analyze the products and services we choose to use, which ultimately greatly impact our our day-to-day -day lives and how happy we are in our lives. So I think do your best to avoid honeypots, not because you want to avoid honeypots, but because you're a person who critically thinks about things around them and wants to choose things that respect them and align with their values. Thank you to our patrons. Thank you to our sponsor, Tutanota. Join our Patreon down below at patreon.com slash techlore to help us make this content. And I will see you next time on Techlore. Thank you all for watching. Uh, it's kind of a fun one to make.